the question that, in my view, H-175 asks, or asks that you decide, is should this essentially lopsided process, which uses the, the sovereign power of the state to take away private property rights, should we say it's okay to use that to expand fossil fuel infrastructure in Vermont? A lot of people have questions about whether the process is fair to begin with, and I, I guess we're not going to fix that. This committee can't fix that. It's a big, big subject. And there are two sides to the question in general, once you get away from fossil fuels. But at least in dealing with the crisis we have with climate change, does it really make sense to allow that process to be used to expand fossil fuel infrastructure? But that's the essential issue, I think, that each 175 raises. I have a process question. Yes. Um, does the process always move in a linear fashion, as you just, just, just described, where the PUC um, process proceeds in eminent domain um, discussion? Great question. The answer is it rarely proceeds in that linear process. <laughs> it rarely proceeds in that linear process because, as um, somebody that we know well, Nathan Palmer, once put it, um, after they have, after the utility has its CPG, and they sit down with you in your kitchen table to quote negotiate the easement, it's like they're sitting there with a loaded gun on the table next to them, because they know they aren't going to lose. A deal you can't refuse. It's a deal you can't refuse. So most cases settle because most people can't afford to hire a lawyer, and the thought of eminent domain <coughs> or con condemnation against the property is terrifying to most people, and so when the soft-spoken representative comes to their table and says, hey, we want to work this out, we want to help you make a nice deal, most people feel they have no choice. And so we never get to the eminent domain part of the case. People sign over an easement deed um, long before a, a, a condemnation petition is filed with the PUC. Yes? I think one of the aspects <clears throat> also is that the, um, the use of eminent domain doesn't require transparency. The deal that's made with one landowner isn't necessarily visible to another landowner who's also going through it. So you could have a very disparate um, remuneration for the tape. That's absolutely true, and that really that issue really came up in spades with the Vermont Gas Natural, Addison Natural Gas Pipeline. Some people did, particularly larger landowners, did hire lawyers, and they got good <coughs> deals, but. The deal included confidentiality, so their neighbor to the north and south never couldn't ever find out about it. Yes. So if um, if this bill were passed and uh, eminent domain, the state were prohibited from using eminent domain to uh, to uh, install fossil fuel uh, infrastructure, how would that have, what impact would that have on the CPG process? I believe the answer is that um, any substantial <coughs> fossil fuel project would not even be filed with the PUC because the utility, the one seeking to start that process, would say, well, what's the point? Uh, the process is time consuming. Uh, I won't say it's expensive for them because all of their expenses get recovered from ratepayers. <laughs> so it's not really expensive for them, but it is time consuming. Um, and it, it's not, it wouldn't be a good use of their time. So this would just effectively persuade utilities not to even try to, to put in fossil fuel infrastructure? I believe so. I think that would be the effect. Yes, with the exception of interstate natural gas pipelines. Right, sure. Yes. Yes. Um, but this would allow, uh, for example, um, development in rights of way and public state highways and things, correct? Yes, it would have no effect on that. It would just be private, private land owners. Yes, for two reasons. One is it's impossible to engage in eminent <coughs> domain against the sovereign. Mm -hmm. So there, there can never be eminent domain against the state. And uh, the DTRANS uh, generally negotiates easement agreements with, well, such as that with VTS. They, they um, negotiated an easement agreement for um, crossing 
Interstate 89, for example, and crossing Route 116 for the A and GP. And the, and the thought behind that was, is is a ban on using eminent domain effectively a ban on build out? And it's that's not as clear, right? Um, well, when I was talking with Representative Cordes about drafting this bill, um, one of the concerns she raised was maybe something Representative Pat had raised, which is if you have uh, say, an existing service territory, which is already served by gas transmission and already served by gas distribution line, and you get somebody at the end of the street who doesn't have gas. It doesn't make any sense to say you can't add to the distribution line to connect them. So it, that exception is written into this draft. And if you have to cross a town street or a state highway, towns and states always give their, give cons generally give consent anyways. But in, in theory, a, a new District, a new transmission pipeline could follow a state highway right of way for a considerable distance. It could, but once it left the right of way, it would encounter its lack of ability to use them and to make. distribution lines to existing transmission. Is that right? But to be as clear as possible, the distinction between transmission and distribution is not obvious. Um, the, the definition that's used nationally and the definition that I believe is actually found the best reading of Vermont statutes um, is that most of the Addison Natural Gas Pipeline would probably qualify as distribution, not transmission under generally accepted standards um, because it's not, because it's, it, the way the definition, you, definition is used nationally is if, um, it's not a through pipeline. It's a pipeline that basically dead ends mm -hmm. and it's not very large. But the way the PSB, the PUC has treated that pipeline and VGS has treated it, they've treated it as a transmission pipeline. And just so everybody knows, the PUC only has jurisdiction over transmission pipelines. The, the PUC does not have jurisdiction over distribution pipelines. Those are governed by zoning and Act 250. So um, the eminent domain, Bill H-175, would say whatever your permitting jurisdiction, whether it's Act 250 or the PUC, if you can't get landowner consent, you're not going to be able to build your pipeline if, you're gonna, if you need to go through private land. Certainly if you're going to go through state land, and the state's willing to give you an easement, that won't be an obstacle. So uh, one of the other bills we're considering is, is uh, H-51, which basically bans any further build-out of uh, natural gas pipelines, transmission lines. Um, <coughs> will passage of that sta statute uh, make this one moot? No. Why? As I put in the, the written testimony, the state of the law is so uncertain right now about the effect of the dormant commerce clause that any lawyer who, who, could, who says he or she can predict for you reliably how any of these bills would fare in court, you shouldn't listen to. Um, but I can say that H-51, which I'm strongly in favor of, is going to be less be more difficult to defend than H-175. Um, there are cases around the country that have already been decided by the federal courts that a federal judge might say would lead to striking down H-51. Other cases would say it shouldn't be struck it down, stricken. But the cases, you can't predict. It's, there's just so many law out there, and the US, so many cases out there, a lot of them, and the US Supreme Court has not spoken and how this dormant commerce clause applies in this situation. Whereas if you restrict the bill to eminent domain, um, it's, it's much stronger because the research I did, and it, you know, I use LexisNexis, which goes back to the very first reported cases of the US Supreme Court and every federal court case. There's only been one case in the history of the Republic in which somebody has challenged a limitation on the state's exercise of eminent domain only one case in the history of the country. And in that case, the South Dakota Railroad case, 
the South Dakota legislature said, we're not going to let out-of-state shippers or users use eminent domain to build a pipeline through South Dakota. You can only use eminent domain if you're going to serve people in South Dakota with this new rail line. So obviously if you're in North Dakota and you want to get ship something to Nebraska and you have to go through South Dakota, you're not going to be able to use eminent domain. And the federal court said, well, that's on its face, the statute discriminates against people out of state and struck it down. That's the only time a limitation on eminent domain has ever been stricken. And this proposed bill doesn't do that. In H-175 is so different from a general ban on fossil fuel infrastructure that it really would be treated differently. And, and the principal reason is that the sovereign power of the state it's protected by the Tenth Amend Amendment to the Constitution, and the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution has never been interpreted as superseding the sovereign power of the state to exercise eminent domain. So it's, we're, we're in an area where it's at the height of state power and the nadir of federal power. Unlike just a ban on whether it's fossil fuel infrastructure or um, nuclear power, whatever it is, which gets federal judges all riled up. Um, does the concept of eminent domain have any meaning in dealing with, with town-owned property or, or other than state-owned property? Um, that's a fascinating question. And um, in the Caprax Park case, the Supreme Court decided that eminent domain can be used against the town, uh, which we lost. Um, so um, this would affect, there would, would have been a different outcome in that case if this were passed. Um, can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. If eminent domain can be used against, can't, well, put it this way, if eminent domain can't be used against town-owned property, um, then the town is in the same situation as a private landowner. If we don't want you to go across our park with this pipeline, then you can't force us to do it. Right. Right. But if, and if this bill passed, then would the town um, be able to say that? Only going forward, not for past projects. Right, right, right. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's interesting. Right. And there are, as some people here know, there's a statute ordering the books that says any conveyance <coughs> of town-owned land, with some exceptions, requires the opportunity for a vote of the public in that town. That's uh, 24 BSA 1061. And um, in Bristol, clients of mine challenged whether the Bristol Select Board had violated mm -hmm. that statute by entering into an agreement with Vermont Gas to let town rights of way be used for a gas pipeline. Denied the motion to dismiss, and then the pipeline deal was rescinded by the select board. So we'll never go any further than that. But the judge said it was a it was a good argument and it was worth um, letting it be explored at trial. So the short answer to your question is, um, if 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 the town that owned a park said or or whatever or school whatever it could be mm -hmm. said no, we don't want you to run this pipeline through it, that would be the end of it because eminent the utility could not threaten the town with eminent domain. I don't know how, how much time we have here, so if... Infinite time. <laughs> um, we've certainly got another uh, 35, 40 minutes. Okay. Uh, and we will take all of your time with questions if you let us. All right, so that's fine. I'm looking to you to be there with a whip and chair. If, if, uh, <laughs> all right. Um, it may be worth spending a little time on the question of interstate natural gas pipelines, because yeah. it's very different from what we've been talking about. Under the Natural Gas Act, there is complete and total preemption of state law when it comes to regulating, citing, anything about interstate natural gas pipelines. <clears throat> but there is one exception, and this is true of every federal permit, and that is Section 401 of the Clean Water Act. Section 401 of the federal Clean Water Act, going back to 1969, whatever it was, um, says no federal permit for anything can be issued if waters of the United States will, may be affected 
unless the state where those waters are says we sort of we grant water quality certification for that use. So no matter what federal statute you're talking about, if, if a permit is required <coughs> from the a federal agency and it affects waters of the United States, which is broadly defined, so it's the Winooski River, it's your favorite trout stream, whatever, it, they're all covered, um, then the state has to give water quality certification or the federal permit cannot be issued. And in many of our surrounding states, Section 401 has been used by the state to stop projects that were against the state's interest. The two that I've been harping on for some time are Connecticut and New York, both of which faced huge interstate gas pipeline projects, and both of which said, you haven't satisfied us that you've examined the alternatives to this pipeline route to our state, and denied the permit, and the U.S. Court of Appeals upheld that in both cases, because 401 is not preempted. It's part of federal law by itself. Um, and I've suggested um, in my testimony, and it's I think beyond dispute, that Vermont has much weaker 401 regulations than New York, Connecticut, and many other states. And unfortunately, right now, there is no general requirement that the applicant demonstrate that this is the least harmful alternative, which is essentially what New York and Connecticut required a showing of. And the pipeline company says we're not said we're not going to do that. The state said no, and the federal courts upheld it. And unfortunately, that would be a difficult argument to make in Vermont. So that that could be another bill, not any of the three in front of you. Well, so I'm curious. What I keep asking questions, right? I'm curious um, what Vermont would have to do in order to invoke Section 401 of a federal, right. the Federal Clean Water Act. So right now what happens is A&R will get a 401 certification request, and they will review it and say yes or no. The state, under federal law, the state has one year from the date of the request to study it, review it, and then say yes or no. If the state, under federal law, if the state doesn't say yes or no within one year, it is deemed to be approved. Um, and the state goes through a review process right now, but the review process, unfortunately, does not include the examination, forcing the applicant to, to consider the alternatives. That's the problem. So there is a review process, but it's uh, not a robust one. So, it's, so the, the, the difference is just requiring uh, the applicant to, to demonstrate or, or, to, or to show that alternative um, routes were, 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 were analyzed. Right, and this has a, a, the concept of no practical alternative actually originates in federal law, and it comes from federal highway law. Um, federal highway law has been in effect since the 60s, that if, if you wanted to build a highway through any park, you can't use federal funds to do that unless you show there's no practical alternative. So it's that same concept. Mm -hmm. and so it's, it's a well-known concept. Um, it'd be nice if, it, if we could be confident that it applies in Vermont, but we can't be. Okay, thank you. I have a question, James. Yes. Uh, which is, uh, in, in your testimony, you kind of lay out um, an example of an interstate pipeline. Uh, I think you... Uh, mentioned a pipeline that would go from Pencil from Pennsylvania through Vermont to Canada or Maine as an example of an interstate pipeline. Um, how is the, the, uh, the pipeline that comes into Vermont currently, gas pipeline into Addison County, how is that, what defines it as um, being under one jurisdiction or another? That pipeline comes down from Canada. Yep. And in the phase two part of the Addison Natural Gas Pipeline cases, VGS proposed to go from Williston to Fort Ticonderoga, mm -hmm. to Ticonderoga. Ticonderoga. Um, so that proposal was submitted to FERC. And if that had gone forward, that would have divested the PUC of any jurisdiction of the case. It did not go forward in part because international paper said it's too expensive, we don't want to be part of it. And once they dropped out, it was no longer an interstate case. Because it only comes into one state? Because it started in Vermont. This, this pipeline started in Vermont and ended okay. in Vermont. Okay. Well, I, was, I was wondering about the, the Canadian connection. Yeah, and that part's a done deal. That's been in effect 
for since the 60s. Okay. Pleasure. Understood. So, so the federal preemption would have occurred in that case, even if along the way we're serving a whole bunch of Vermont customers before? Okay. Yes. So looking at H51, um, I think through a, a drafting error, some of the arcane wording of Section 248 caused a little mistake. Section 248 refers to natural gas facilities, and in drafting H51, that language was just incorporated by reference. So H51 in part proposes to amend Section 248, to and it says no natural gas facilities uh, will be or would be subject to H51 would apply to natural gas facilities. The problem is that Section 248 defines natural gas facilities as being only transportation of fuel. A natural gas facility is defined as only natural gas pipeline. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's the way the statute defines it. A separate part of Section 248 governs all electric generating stations. So that Section 248 works because if you were to build a natural gas generating station in Vermont, it would be covered by 248, even though it's not called a natural gas facility. The problem with HFD1 is it only applies to natural gas facilities. And so I propose language to broaden that to say, a natural gas facility or electric generation station that uses fossil fuel. And that way, I think the intent of the drafters would be served. Um, the second change I think is needed is the definition of infrastructure in the bill itself is limited to facilities that transport fuel. And I don't think that's the intent, so I've suggested um, that that also be broadened. Um, and you could use the language from H-175, which says facilities that transport fuel, fossil fuel, or also that, quote, produce electricity, heat, or other energy using fossil fuel. That's on page uh, six of my memo. If you just added that to the definition section of H-51, you would fix the problem. And I propose also adding to H-51 H the language from H-175 that excludes from the prohibition facilities or structures necessary to more, to more safely or more economically serve customers in an existing service territory. Again, so if you've got somebody in an area that's already basically built out by a gas transmission and distribution system, and they're the last ones at the end of the street, it seems you wouldn't gain much and you lose a lot by not allowing them to hook up. Um, Talking about H-175, eminent domain, um, I have to thank Professor Chavaria for being really forthright with me over the last week. We've gone back and forth by email and telephone about this bill, and um, he gave me a, um, some law review articles I had not found, uh, including one I've quoted in this memo. It is the latest law review article on this subject. Journals that, I think every law school in America has these journals. and. If it's the Harvard Law Review and it has an article in it, everybody reads it and it's like the gospel. If it's another law review, maybe it is important, maybe it isn't. Um, this is a, an article in the Minnesota Law Review, so it's a well-respected law school by professors who really know this stuff. And in this article, they say one way to deal with what we're talking about here today is to limit your eminent domain statutes so they do not include fossil fuels within the definition of public benefit or public good. And so, it, it, you know, I only found out about this article last week from John, and yet this is a bill that's been in the hopper for, for months, and the article points out that some states have already done this. Um, Georgia and South Carolina um, changed their eminent domain statutes to eliminate use of eminent domain for oil pipelines several years ago. Those were temporary moratoriums, moratoria, um, that have since expired. Um, but because the legislature was concerned, they said at least for the next three years, there will be no eminent domain for oil pipelines in our states, both Georgia and South Carolina. And Colorado has it, unlike those two states, Colorado has a statute on the books that's not a temporary statute that says you cannot use eminent domain for oil pipelines. So this bill 
builds on those models, and it's not all that extraordinary, and it's what these law school professors have suggested as a, at least a, pot, a partial solution to the problem. So one thing I would add to the discussion, which the law review articles talk about, is if we're interested in clean power and climate change, you don't want to cast the net too broadly because a lot of experts say this and some dispute it. I don't know who's right, but at least there's some good science to support the argument that we need eminent domain in the future for to get solar power and wind power from parts of the country where they have it in abundance to parts of the country where we need it. So if you have you know, huge wind farms in Iowa, they can't use all the power in Iowa, and they need to get it to Chicago, that concept. Um, you don't want to cripple eminent domain, so that clean power can't be brought where it's needed. So, but this bill doesn't have that problem because it's restricted to fossil fuel, eminent domain for fossil fuel usage. H214 um, is a bill I think is uh, largely a great idea. One clause of it I, I'm leery of. In general, what H214 does is it takes a concept that the Vermont PUC has had on its books since the Hydro Quebec case, the decision in 1990. In 1990, the PSB ruled that it was proper for the PSB to consider the impi impacts on Vermonters of massive hydro development in northern Quebec. <coughs> the evidence was that the proposed mega dams would flood subarctic, huge areas of subarctic land and release really large quantities of methane. So it was, methane was the problem there too. And this would be a substantial contribution to greenhouse gas effects, even though it was hydropower because of the large area being flooded. And uh, so that was one impact from development in Quebec that would affect people in Vermont. The other was that migratory waterfowl that go through Vermont, many species are actually dependent <coughs> on nesting and staging habitat in northern Quebec. And we wouldn't have those birds in Vermont during the spring and fall if the habitat were destroyed in northern Quebec. So the board said, in those two ways, what happens in Quebec affects people in Vermont. And we can look at that in this proceeding. And in fact, what the board did under Chairman Coward is they restricted the size of the purchase so that in the board's view, it would not contribute to the mega dams. It would just, be, it would just use power from the existing dams. That concept is now in Section 248 because 248 now has it built right into it consideration of greenhouse gases, which affect everybody. Um, H214 improves on the existing statute by mandating that the PUC actually look at the leakage question, the leakage of methane during extraction and transmission. Um, the board has been doing that, but it's great that the statute says it has to be considered and it, that it's an important factor the board has to base its decision upon. I'm not a scientist, but I, I read the articles, and the scientific consensus now is that natural gas, the life cycle, quote unquote, life cycle impacts of natural gas are far worse than oil for home heating and for electric generation because of the powerful <coughs> potency of methane to destroy the atmosphere. So H214 says we, we, the board needs to consider that. Yes? Good question. While I'm thinking of it. Um, so let's say a uh, uh, Industrial wind project on the ridge line uh, was approved or was going through the approval process. Uh, the ridge line was owned by an individual property owner, but to get to the main road where the transmission lines were, you had to go through three other people's property. Is there an eminent, eminent domain um, statute that can be used to take that property to get those lines down to the main transmission line? The existing eminent domain statutes would allow that. Okay. And I'm going to barge in here. Um, with regard to um, what you had just described with the PUC under existing statute and rule um, being required to look at things like leakage. Actually, I'm, I, don't want to, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm, I'm trying to play this back. That um, you said in the, in the Addison uh, County pipeline case, they did look at things like leakage. I don't know if they were required to, but they chose to look past that. Um, how would 214 raise the bar 
in terms of what they're to take into consideration? I think it, it, you could argue it doesn't raise the bar. It makes explicit in statute what's already in its prior decisions, mm -hmm. in the PUC's prior decisions. And in those prior decisions, they didn't, they chose to look past that issue, or maybe not look past it, but not weigh it to a point where it would preclude them from issuing a CPG. Yes, I think it's fair to say that the PUC decision in the Addison case was that the science doesn't support the conclusion that this is enough of a problem to reject the pipeline. But that was a case decided in 2013 based on testimony from 2010 and 2011. And the science has changed dramatically since then. So um, just in answer to your question, um, this, this part of 214 is not a radical change. It's reinforcing what the cases issued by the PUC have said. And it says, we're going to hold you to that, basically. Okay. The part of 214 that, that I was looking at was the the, uh, the lifespan that that uh, that the PUC would require the utility to use um, for 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 pricing out what it was going to cost repairs. Um, section E. No, I don't have that in mind. Okay. Um, so, Public Utility Commission shall not allow companies to finance the construction of a pipeline through rates beyond the useful lifetime of the infrastructure. So the use of lifetime of the infrastructure is shortened by the fact that we can't use it because it's, it's, it, it will be stranded, then, then that, would make, um, that would make the investment much less economic. Um, so I'm just wondering about yeah, that, that part of it. That part of it doesn't strike me as constructive because the testimony was that the useful lifetime of the ANGP was 50 years. Right, that's that's the that's the uh, the engineering lifespan. Yes, but if the if the uh, if the if the lifespan due to the the uh, proposition that we can't use it past say twenty thirty, then the lifespan is actually twelve years, or whatever. It perhaps the statute could be wor reworded to say that, um, as I read it, it's the engineering expected life use usefulness of the physical object, mm -hmm. not the regulatory expectation. Um, the useful lifetime. So yeah. I guess it's a matter of defining what that means. But um, so that seemed to me to be a, a, a useful approach to to um, to the problem because uh, if 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 it can't be if if you know if you if you're if you're saying that you're going to have to recover all these costs within a, this period of time, not the 50 years that the that the pipe might be actually intact in the ground, then that affects the economics. True, um, but I think the, the PUC decision takes into account the state energy goals and says this still is going to be useful over its expected physical uh, life. Right, and, and, but this 214 would, would give them a different instruction. And, and that maybe it needs to be worded differently, but, but that's how I was looking at that clause in the, in the proposed. And so you have, I think, a more complete understanding the ANGP was really an aberration when it comes to this issue of um, when does the project become economic. It's really an aberration nationally because FERC, which deals with pipelines, gas pipelines all the time, has a general rule that they will not approve of pipelines that will not be paid for from the rates from the new customers with small, tiny exceptions. New York, the New York PSC has the same rule. So this pipeline would never have been built if it had to meet FERC standards, because there are only 3,000 new customers. It's a $165 million pipeline. That's $50,000 per customer. So th this pipeline was built on the backs of the existing customers, which federal law would never have allowed if this had gone through FERC. And, you, and if this was the other side of the lake, New York, they would have said, you're kidding. Mm -hmm. so if, if we just, you know, so. Maybe we just need FERC laws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. The other part of H214 that I was addressing in my memo was <coughs> looking at water quality impacts, say, from fracking in Pennsylvania or Ohio. That's pretty weak under the Dormant Commerce Clause because none of those impacts affect people in Vermont. And so it really looks like the Vermont legislature is trying to tell regulators in Pennsylvania or Ohio what to do. That would be low-hanging fruit for utility lawyers. 
we wanted to give them low hanging fruit. I want to go back and yeah. explore uh, Representative Campbell's question a little more um, in terms of what 214 does. And uh, this is a particular interest to me, um, though I don't know if it's a fertile place to explore. Um, again, which is what is the useful life of this asset um, or, uh, you know, an asset that might be um, considered uh, and to what extent ratepayers could be left holding the bag. Um, and uh, with regard to the Addison plan, I mean, you've, you've kind of already laid out the case, but the legislature could go as far, this bill doesn't, but could go as far as um, being specific um, for certain types of infrastructure, fossil fuel infrastructure, as to what the useful life will be um, when the calculation is done as to what does the return have to be from ratepayers in order for this utility to, you know, reap an acceptable rate of return. Um, and the question I have, or the concern that I have from a ratepayer perspective, is if that time frame is squeezed from 50 years to 20 or 15, no, um, no, no project would make sense. There's no way that the utility could reap uh, a return on, on its investment in that short of time. And um, again, from a practical standpoint, I don't think we're going to be using these pipelines in 2050. And so, you know, I'm concerned, I know the AARP is concerned, that ratepayers are going to be left holding the bag on this $165 million pipeline, much less another pipeline that we might consider. Um, so, you know, is it worthwhile for the legislature to explore um, stranded costs and, and what a, a, a reasonable um, timeline is um, for payback for utility for these types of investments. So they're, they're How hard is it to prove that case? If you want? Your question addresses two different issues. One is in permitting a project that has not been built, how yeah. do we address, address this issue? And second is when we have a project that's already been built, what happens when the, the project becomes uneconomic? Those are really different questions. So, if we have a project that's already in the ground, and alternatives for customers are less expensive, so to use this example, if the gas pipeline starts losing customers because they've all got cold climate heat pumps, and it costs them less to heat their homes with a heat pump than to continue to buy gas, well, first of all, that's a risk that the utility takes. It's a private business. They get a return on their investment. That's one of the risks they've entered into in building this pipeline. That's not really a public risk. And we, we you and I have discussed this very briefly. Yep. In the situation of Green Mountain Power and CEPS, when they overcommitted to the Hydro-Quebec contract, and it turned out it was far more expensive than other costs, other sources of electricity. Is it in the early 90s? Yes. Mm -hmm. And they went to the PUC and said, we need help. We're going to go bankrupt if you don't help us. We need rates that go up that we can't justify under traditional rate making principles. And the only reason is to keep us from going bankrupt. Um, and you know, that's the situation that <coughs> gas would be in. And that's really a question of how important it is to keep that utility out of bankruptcy. Well, a gas pipeline is very different from an electric company. Electric service is really essential. And so the board had good reason to say, we don't want to start what some people call the death spiral. Of, you know, smaller and smaller rate base, and costs are the same or up, and then as, as, as rates go up, even more people drop out. Do you want that to happen to an electric utility? The board was concerned about that. It's, gas is different than electricity, because every, every gas customer already has electricity. And every gas customer can use heat, cold climate heat pumps. So, that's much less of a public concern. It's more just a concern if you're worried about VGS's sole shareholder and whether we want to worry about their bottom line. Okay. If, if, it's, if we're looking at this prospectively, um, which I think this bill addresses, and I think that the language of the bill could be tweaked to capture more of what I think your intent is, and that is let's look at state energy policy, when we're going to be required to be at renewables, exactly. and say the, the when you're submitting your application to the POC, 
don't use the expected physical lifetime of the project. Let's limit that by the state's energy policy goal. So it may be 20 years, not 50. But to what end? To what end? So that the project would not be approved of, because once you do the calculations using a 20-year life period rather than 50, um, the rates that would have to be paid to support the project become obviously unacceptable. But if the utility is saying, yeah, we hear you saying it's a 15-year project, it's really a 50-year project, and here are the rates we're going to charge. Um, it's it's the, the, the I don't understand the difference between that example and the one you gave with existing infrastructure, um, because you know the the the, uh, the new pipeline maybe that utility chooses to take that risk, but it's not the risk to take. It's a, it's a this gets back to our initial discussion of the utility is exercising a franchise granted by the state of Vermont. It's not like General Motors or IBM. They don't get to make these decisions because by themselves because the legislature said they can't. That's why they passed Section 248. So if the PUC says, well, you want to use a 50-year time frame, we want to use 20, they're the decider. It's not the management of the corporation that's the sole decider. Right, the decision that's made is the, is the rate that can be charged. No, the decision's but not made at that in the 248 as to the rate rates that can be charged, that's a separate case. Yep. But the PUC would say, what will the expected impact be on rates going forward? And um, that's consideration number one. But I think a better analogy is, um, for years, the PUC, since 90-something, the PUC has, says, has said, has ruled, we're not going to look at um, what the market says are the costs of this electricity. We're going to add the adder for environmental impacts. And there's a certain number of cents per kilowatt hour that take into account environmental impacts. And the board has developed this as a way to consider the true cost of a project. And so the utility will say, hey, we're going to make money off this. But the POC will say, if you include the true cost of the project by including the air pollution adder, it's actually a net loser. And it use, if you change to 214 to incorporate the public policy that we'd be done with fossil fuels by a certain date, um, basically you'd be at putting, you'd be raising the cost because to the ratepayers because it would have to be returned, recovered in a much shorter time frame, and it'd be like the, the air pollution adder, and the PUC would then say, well, as we do the analysis on behalf of the people that say it Vermont, we actually think it doesn't make sense. Okay. Good, question. I understand when you were talking about how everybody's an electrical customer and, and the gas customers may go to uh, heat pumps and, and, and want to, but what about the industries? I mean, uh, I can't see that the industrial usage of electricity is going to be comparable at any point to gas when it comes to the amount that some industries might have to use. What, right. Great what question. That? And um, this question has come up before, both in Vermont and elsewhere. Um, Agrimark in Middlebury uses gas, cabbage cheese, and um, they're using, they were using truck gas. Vermont Gas had to admit in the rate case that AERP brought and went to the Supreme Court that they could not legitimately use the, co the cost of serve, sorry, the rates from serving Agrimark in justification for the project because they made less money by selling pipe gas to Agrimark than selling truck gas. So it never figured in the, the economic justification for the, for the gas pipeline. And then the flip side of this, from the customer's point of view, they already had truck gas available. And from society's point of view, if you don't invest $165 million in a project, then if there's a better alternative that becomes available for Agrimark, the public hasn't invested in keeping them in the old way. Instead of having a truck show up, I don't know if it's going to be wood chips or it's going to be hydrogen or whatever it's going to be. Maybe it's going to be biogas from someplace in Salisbury. But we haven't locked in $165 million infrastructure to serve that plant. So my, my short answer is if there are industries that use gas in Vermont, and we can satisfy that need for now without locking in our future for the next 50 years. Can you run hydrogen through a natural gas pipeline? 
I don't think so, but that's being considered as a, a transportable, safe way to provide energy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's just open the door for five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Good idea. Thank you. Um, it's too uh, long. If people want to stand up and go, oh, great. We're going to call. We're going to uh, call our next so witness in five minutes. So there's a two-fold up. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Away, yeah. Further away from your body. John, this is Tim Brigland calling. Um, we uh, we have you here on a speakerphone in our committee room. Um, so welcome to the uh, House Energy and Technology Committee. Appreciate you joining us today. Um, we have uh, the committee gathered around the table and probably another uh, 10, 12 people in the room. And um, just to kind of set the table as to where we are this afternoon, um, we just heard uh, Jim Dumont um, speak for um, a little under an hour uh, and giving us uh, his thoughts on the three fossil fuel infrastructure bills that we have in committee. And um, understand that you have some time to join us as well. And um, we have your written testimony on our, on our website and some members have it up as well in front of them, including me. So you are, um, you are welcome to take us through your testimony uh, as you uh, as you see fit. Uh, certainly, don't feel the need to read it, but um, we've got that in front of us to do as well. So, uh, it's up to you how you want to take us uh, through the testimony. What I will say is, um, on this end, we record all of our um, testimony. So, if as you start, you can kind of introduce yourself for the record, that would be great. And. Um, I will try and direct questions as they come in from this side. Um, try not to interrupt you, but as you know, people have questions here. I will. Um, I'll let you know, and, and you can take it from there. So, um, thank you again for joining us. Really appreciate you taking a couple couple minutes out of your day. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, my name is John Echevarria. I'm a resident of Stratford, Vermont, and delighted to have the opportunity to participate in this hearing today. And I appreciate um, your allowing me to participate by telephone. Um, uh, Tuesday is, is uh, we're still in class here at Vermont Law School. Tuesday is a terrible day for me, and I just completed teaching a class, and I have another one coming up. Um, so I just couldn't make it up to Montpelier um, for the hearing. No, this so, is great. Uh, this, this works fine for us. And again, appreciate you making time in a busy day. So I um, am. Uh, my, to the extent I bring any expertise to the issues you're debating, it, it's uh, largely in the area of property and property rights and the takings question, the use of eminent domain. It's an issue I've um, uh, written about and been involved in litigation about uh, and, and thought of a fair amount about. Um, I have um, a deep interest in the future energy policy of, of Vermont and I have a a, a passing familiarity with the key issues, and, I, and I'm uh, familiar with the major pieces of legislation that are now pending in front of the House um, and this committee. But I thought what I, what I would do, uh, because it really is my area of expertise and where I think I can, can perhaps um, provide some added value, is to focus on, on H-175, um, which addresses the use of eminent domain for fossil fuel infrastructure in, in the state of Vermont. Um, and um, uh, I, my, my testimony is fairly straightforward, and I'm just going to have to you know, summarize it, it very quickly. Um, first of all, uh, uh, eminent domain is, is, a, um, is, is, is one of the more controversial topics uh, out there. Um, I, I say in my testimony that I, I've never met anybody who, who welcomed being subjected to eminent domain um, despite receiving full and fair just compensation under the, under the, uh, the Constitution. Um, people don't like to have their, their property taken regardless of the purpose uh, and, and regardless of the validity of the government's objective in taking the property. And, 
and I, I think I, under, I, I understand that. I think everyone around the room understands that. I compare eminent domain to, uh, uh, to death and taxes on the, on the list of, of, of popular issues. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand uh, the, this, the courts uh, have repeatedly upheld the eminent domain power. It, it goes back to the very early days of the Republic. Uh, and I don't think there's really any serious question about its constitutionality or of its enormous public value. Um, and, and basically, it, it, uh, it serves the purpose of allowing the government uh, to address the problem of a holdout. Um, in order to promote a whole variety of public objectives and valuable development purposes, it's, it's necessary to assemble land, uh, either in a linear fashion, such as for a transmission line, or to acquire a particular uh, uh, location that serves a public function particularly well. Um, and, for under and government often proceeds on a willing seller basis trying to uh, locate uh, property owners able and willing to sell property uh, at, at a reasonable price. Uh, but for a whole variety of reasons, uh, sometimes in an effort to get a higher price, sometimes just for, for, for reasons of personal preference, uh, property owners are unwilling to sell property. Uh, and so in order to deal with that holdout problem, um, the, the, the law has long accorded the sovereign the right to take property by eminent domain. Um, and although it is, as I say, uh, invariably uh, unpopular, uh, and it's a very um, strong uh, exercise of governmental power, one that needs to be uh, supervised and watched and that, and that can sometimes be abused, I think it's absolutely essential. Um, and so um, my, my take uh, on the use of this eminent domain issue in the context of energy development and fossil fuel development um, is that uh, for a variety of reasons curtailing uh, this important governmental power, uh, even for the worthy objective uh, of, a, of curtailing fossil fuel development and addressing the climate problem facing Vermont and the world, um, is not the optimal way to go. Um, you have uh, other bills uh, before you, uh, H51 and H214, um, which you know, one of which uh, is, a, is essentially a, uh, a ban on, on future fossil fuel uh, development in the state, and another one which directs the Public Service Board uh, to um, scrutinize the climate impacts of future fossil fuel development uh, with uh, greater skepticism and care than it has uh, in the past. And I think both of those uh, uh, bills uh, aim in the right direction and, and, uh, and are, are, are appropriate. Um, I have, as I lay out my testimony, as I'll briefly summarize, I have five basic concerns um, with the, the approach taken in, in, in H-175. Um, the first is that, is that uh, legislation that curtails the use of eminent domain uh, for fossil fuel problems addresses the climate change problem in an indirect fashion. Uh, the, the, the concern here is development of future, future infrastructure um, that uh, leads to initial, additional greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and whether or not a project is built with the uh, aid of eminent domain or not with the aid of eminent domain really doesn't uh, address the pivotal issue, which is whether or not the project gets built. Um, and I think everything else being equal, the legislature is better off addressing an issue directly rather than indirectly, and rather than trying to um, uh, make, uh, uh, to put a constraint or, or a, uh, hamstring, so to speak, um, fossil fuel development better to confront it directly by either raising the regulatory bar for approval of fossil fuel development or, or banning it uh, altogether. Um, the second issue is it's not entirely clear to me that, that this bill would be entirely effective in, in its objectives. The, the, the idea is that um, it, it, absent the power of eminent domain, it would be difficult to assemble corridors and look, uh, acquire sites for fossil fuel development. And I have no doubt that without the eminent domain power, um, fossil fuel development would be deterred and in some instances it would go forward. Um, but eminent domain is not always essential uh, for projects to go forward. Um, my understanding is the Northern Pass project in, in, uh, in New Hampshire, a large transmission line, 
um, which is running into a whole variety of regulatory objectives, uh, objections that may never ultimately be built, uh, has nonetheless, uh, uh, the developers have nonetheless managed to put together a right-of-way uh, uh, through a variety of means, but not including the use of the eminent domain power. So um, the absence of the eminent domain power is a, is a constraint, but it's not a complete barrier to fossil fuel development. And, uh, a bill like H51 would be would accomplish the goal much more, not only directly but in a more certain way. Um, the the other thing is that I, I think it is it has been suggested that um, the the other bills which seek to directly control or prohibit fossil fuel development might be subject to federal constitutional challenges. And that's certainly possible, depending on how they're crafted. But I think it's also true that the approach of curtailing the eminent domain power uh, can raise concerns, um, if not under the Supremacy Clause, and under the Dormant Commerce Clause, again, depending on how it's all drafted. So simply going the, the path of curtailing eminent domain doesn't uh, avoid all the possible uh, federal constitutional problems. Um, the, the fourth point I wanted to make is that, is that although um, I strongly support the goal of um, uh, curtailing fossil fuel development and, and see its, uh, its enormous value in, in meeting the state uh, uh, climate goals, um, it's, it's also true that the use of the eminent domain power may be very helpful in achieving those goals. Um, limiting uh, the use of eminent domain for fossil fuel plants uh, would obviously deter future fossil fuel development, but looking to the future, um, many uh, policymakers and many uh, and members of this committee and other leaders in the state have said that the future path for Vermont involves electrification of our power system, um, which means finding more sources uh, of electricity and finding more ways of making electrical power widely available for a whole variety of energy end uses. Um, and uh, that may well require um, uh, an expanded or new transmission capacity in the, in the state. Um, and the, providing that transmission capacity would be greatly aided by the availability of eminent domain in some circumstances. And I understand one could logically say, well, we want to keep eminent domain for, for electrical transmission lines carrying power generated by wind, but not for fossil fuel. Um, I think singling out the use of the eminent, focusing on the eminent domain power in any context um, may have a tendency to engender opposition to um, uh, the use of eminent domains in, in other contexts where we'd like to keep it. Um, this is a, a, a kind of, this is an issue in Vermont, but it's also a larger issue nationally. Um, those who are advocating increased reliance on renewables or looking to the upper Midwest as a fruitful area to generate a, a great deal of wind power. Um, but then the question becomes how to get that to, to market primarily in the, in the eastern third of the United States, which would require um, very ex expansive um, uh, expansion of the transmission capacity and probably reliance uh, uh, on the eminent domain power. And it's not clear that on a national basis um, we have the capacity to build uh, uh, large-scale interstate transmission lines that would facilitate the kind of national uh, uh, turn to renewable power that we need to do. So this is an issue both on a national and on, and on a state level. And then I, my final point is really more of a philosophical one, which is that um, in order to address the climate change, it seems to me that the, the government uh, and the, the people uh, supporting the government need to um, be able and willing to impose uh, reasonable regulation on the use of property, controlling the exploitation of property assets, including but not limited to the vast petroleum reserves that are in the ground and that Bill McKibben tells us we need to keep in the ground. Um, so, um, and claims of private property rights and entitlements are sometimes raised in opposition to the kind of regulation we need to achieve climate goals. Um, and uh, it makes me nervous uh, in this narrow context to be um, uh, advocating for expanded private property rights, uh, even if it's uh, for a worthy goal, because I think it may unintentionally, in the general sense, uh, reinforce the claim that, that private property rights should stand as an obstacle 
uh, to progress on climate change. So um, for all those reasons, and, and especially because I think there are other bills uh, that are now pending in front of your committee that would accomplish much of the same objective uh, in a more direct and more effective way, I am, uh, I guess to summarize, skeptical about uh, H-175 and um, I guess urge the committee to uh, devote more time and energy into the other bills than, than to this one. So that in brief, I, I, I know uh, James who knows a lot about this issue and has had enormous background, could easily go on for an hour, but I have not gone on for an hour, but I'm happy to answer questions at whatever length you, you uh, like. Them. Well, he covered, he covered uh, three bills, whereas you've only taken on one, John. So. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I do have a question, and um, it, it relates to, um, I, I think, some law journal articles that you had generously directed uh, Mr. Dumont to. Um, and I think they, were, and I have not seen them, but I think they relate to um, the use of eminent domain, uh, or, or the, the prohibition on the use of eminent domain for um, I think it was for oil pipelines in a couple of southern states, Georgia and South Carolina, and um, Colorado may have scratched away at this as well on a more uh, a more standing basis. I think in South Carolina and Georgia it was done on a temporary basis. Is that something that you can speak to? Um, you know, whether it's to to the you know those states maybe reaching a policy a policy objective using what you might characterize as kind of a crude instrument, um, but if you could speak to the experience of those states, or if you have something to offer there, that would be. I, I'm just, I'm familiar, uh, I've read the, uh, scanned the same articles that I, I received and passed on to James, and I am, uh, and I know that, um, that I believe there were both temporary measures uh, in Georgia and in South Carolina in response to a something called the Palmetto Pipeline Project, which was exceedingly unpopular, uh, particularly in Georgia, because it involved trans shipping a large quantity of oil through the state without any providing any benefit to the state of Georgia. Um, and um, and uh, but as I say, I believe those were, were temporary. I, I don't um, have any doubt that the, that the state has the um, authority uh, to craft its statutes regarding eminent domain in any, uh, any way it wants, uh, subject to federal constitutional constraints. In order for a taking to be lawful, it has to be constitutional, which means it has to serve, the taking has to serve a public use, and it has to be accompanied by just compensation. Uh, and it also has to be statutorily authorized. Uh, and if the legislature decides to remove the statutory authorization, for the eminent domain power, then to the extent projects depend on state eminent domain power, they're no longer authorized. Of course, none of this has anything to do with interstate gas pipelines, which are licensed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and, and the, the licensees from FERC um, are uh, authorized to take property under the federal eminent domain power, so none of that bears on this. But I think it's, it's, um, uh, it's permissible um, for the legislature uh, within under under Vermont law to decide when and where for what purposes to authorize the use of the eminent domain power. Um, it doesn't, um, I think it's, um, uh, it's striking, I think, or it's maybe telling um, that there seem to be relatively few examples around the country uh, of uh, restrictions on the use of eminent domain for um, for energy projects and more efforts to try to uh, directly control the production of, of fossil fuel um, uh, powered uh, energy and to regulate the, the mix of, of uh, renewables in the, in the state's energy supply. So it, it, it's certainly an approach that's been used, but I don't think it's been used widely. Okay. Um, we have another representative, Representative Campbell, who has a question. Yeah, hi there. Um, I'm wondering if you can point to any regulations in, from other states or, or, or bills under consideration in other, in other states that would uh, regulate the construction of fossil fuel facilities more directly? Well, there's a, um, 
uh, you're getting you're getting outside my area of expertise. One of the um, um, I don't know if Jim discussed the um, I'm reaching for some papers here uh, the Heidegger decision from the Eighth Circuit, um, which is a um, 2016 decision from the United States Court of Appeals from the Eighth Circuit um, that struck down in part um, Minnesota uh, legislation um, that sought to um, uh, drive the decarbonization of the electric power system in, in Minnesota. Um, and there are a number of um, provisions uh, in, the, um, in the law. Some of them uh, were, were struck down by the court on the grounds that they um, sought to regulate um, too directly um, the, um, the, the conduct of the energy business in, in other states. Um, on the other hand, um, there's a um, provision in the law which prohibited the construction within Minnesota of new large energy facilities, and new large energy facilities that would contribute to statewide carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and as the judges in this case noted, the, the plaintiffs did not even seek to challenge that provision of, of Minnesota law, uh, which I assume is still in place and, and uh, has not been successfully challenged by any other party. Um, so my um, um, uh, that, that's the one example I can I can pull out for you. My um, uh, admittedly somewhat not expert analysis suggests that there's no there's no particular constitutional problem with the state of Vermont attempting to directly regulate or even prohibit uh, in-state generation uh, of power using fossil fuels. I think it's on a number of occasions the Public Service Board has, uh, either in rejecting projects or in uh, sanctioning projects, has considered whether or not the projects would lead to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I, as far as I know, the authority of that state entity to consider that issue hasn't been questioned. Um, and um, so I don't think, um, pending further research and hearing from other people, a serious question that the state of Vermont could um, ban uh, fossil fuel infrastructure or wanted to. But I, um, I'm i afraid I don't have additional examples for one of, you know, the one I just cited you. Okay. Well, the, uh, other, the other bill that we're looking at, H214, would come at it a little, a little different way. It uh, would talk about uh, requiring the PUC to consider the uh, the useful life span of, of the facility, not necessarily the physical lifespan of the facility, in, in uh, calculating the economics of whether the the, uh, the company should be allowed to build, uh, or, should, or should receive a certificate of public good to build. Right. Yeah, I'm not familiar uh, with any other states that have, have adopted uh, that approach. I mean, the the one the provision of that. Uh, proposal that stands out for me is the, is the uh, requirement that the Public Service Board um, uh, determine whether the, um, the uh, leakage uh, of um, gas um, um, uh, and the adverse effects of that leakage uh, are outweighed by the good to the state. Right. So basically doing a cost-benefit analysis, uh, weighing greenhouse gas emissions and deciding whether or not to to issue a certificate of public good. Right, right. That's the um, other dimension of that bill. Right. Yeah, that, uh, right. But my understanding is the state basically, the, 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 you have before you three options. One is banning fossil fuel. <laughs> uh, the other one is, is, is 214, directing the Public Service Board to uh, Way a greenhouse gas impacts, and then the third approach is to ban the use of eminent domain in connection with such projects. So. Okay, thank you. Other questions? John, Rep uh, Representative Briglin had to step out. Uh, this is Representative Sevilla. Um, do you have additional testimony? I'm, I'm, I'm done. If you're done. <laughs> Thank you so much for making time to join us today. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Did I do it? <laughs> <laughs> Technical voice over here. I need that. I need that with a hammer.
<laughs> Appropriate technology. <laughs> we call that percussive maintenance. <laughs> Unplug it and plug it back in. Hello. Uh, greetings. For the record, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, or VPER. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. As many of you uh, know, VPIRG is the largest consumer and environmental advocacy organization in Vermont. We've got about 50,000 members <coughs> and supporters uh, in communities all across the state. And we've been working since our founding in 1972 um, with a particular focus on energy issues uh, from our earliest days. So it, it really is uh, a pleasure to be with you as you consider uh, several um, issues related to fossil fuel infrastructure today. I want to note uh, before I begin that uh, uh, I am an attorney, but usually when VPIRG engages in litigation, we're smart enough to hire professionals like Jim Dumont uh, behind me here. So we have uh, hired Jim to represent us in a number of different cases over the years, including one involving the um, natural gas uh, proposed uh, uh, phase two pipeline, uh, for instance. Um, Jim is not representing us here today, but uh, appreciate uh, always the opportunity to work with him and, um, and share some time with him. Um, I won't uh, kind of belabor all of the points about the problems with um, fossil fuels generally. I, I do want to note a couple of specific points about uh, natural gas, particularly uh, natural gas that is derived from fracking, shale gas uh, fracking. As Mr. Dumont noted, uh, what we're talking about here is, is methane, um, which though it has been marketed as the clean fossil fuel over the years, um, more recent analysis, more recent studies have proven that methane is uh, a very potent greenhouse gas, far more potent than carbon dioxide itself. And when you take into consideration the life cycle analysis, particularly the leakage um, that comes from the fracking operations and the transmission of that gas uh, to ultimately to customer use, um, it, there, there are estimates that it actually is far worse as a greenhouse gas uh, as a problem for climate emissions than uh, oil or even coal. And so it is, the more you learn about uh, gas, particularly shale gas, um, uh, which is which is largely what we're talking about here. We don't know the exact percentages, but certainly uh, Vermont Gas Systems is using gas that comes from fracking operations in Canada. Um, it is not, it should not be considered any longer the clean uh, fossil fuel from a climate perspective. But climate emissions aren't the only concern when it comes to natural gas. Um, as a matter of fact, we've looked, we've done some research looking back over uh, the information that's available about uh, leaks and explosions and accidents at pipelines. And we find that over the last five years, uh, there have been 20 deaths annually on average in the United States linked to these uh, natural gas pipeline accidents, an average of $453 million worth of property damage uh, each year and many injuries as well. I will submit for the record the testimony uh, here that I have as well, and that will give you more, some more, uh, more details on this information. I don't think anyone's surprised we hear, if you pay attention in the media, you see fairly regularly problems with uh, pipelines um, where not just uh, leakage, but uh, accidents, property damage, uh, even personal injury, and occasionally uh, even death. Um, just uh, last September, September 13, 2018, uh, I'm sure everyone in this room uh, heard about the um, uh, explosion and problems associated with pipeline, the pipelines in three communities outside of Boston, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, th those explosions killed one person, caused over 80 fires, led to 30,000 evacuations. Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker uh, declared a state of emergency. Customers were left without heat and some without hot water for months after that uh, explosion. Uh, the faulty pipelines and the concerns uh, have been felt here in Vermont as well, and uh, you've heard some of the challenges of building 
phase one of the Vermont gas systems uh, pipeline that went down into Middlebury, um, the tremendous cost overruns that we're seeing there. Um, we were, as I mentioned, involved in the proposed phase two pipeline, which would have taken it under uh, Ticonderoga, uh, under the lake to Ticonderoga. That ultimately was pulled back, but that too was subject to a number of concerns and projected cost overruns, et cetera. So um, it's not, uh, we are not immune to those issues even here in Vermont. Uh, concerning the legislation before you then, we, we are very supportive of uh, the policies that will take Vermont away from further dependence on fossil fuel um, and move us toward 100% um, clean renewable energy. Um, you have heard no doubt of a number of states moving in the direction of 100% renewable energy, particularly for electricity, though over time we need to be going even more broadly than that as we electrify heating and transportation opportunities in the state, um, the, the electricity sector and the renewable nature of that um, becomes even more important. So we strongly support the idea of moving toward clean renewable energy, uh, but these are really two sides of the same coin. As we support, and, and either I or my colleagues at VPIRB will be in this chair talking to you about uh, Global Warming Solutions Act and, and other uh, ideas to move forward in a positive direction with respect to renewables, the other side of that coin is to stop our dependence, further dependence and further development of fossil fuel infrastructure. Among the several priorities, or several bills that you've been discussing, uh, we favor H51, which, uh, as you know, would be, uh, uh, which is designed to prohibit new fossil fuel infrastructure in the state. Um, we are supportive of the several amendments or opportunities for improvement that Mr. Dumont uh, mentioned. That is to say, most fundamentally, that it would apply to facilities that burn fossil fuels for um, electricity, for instance. There's no particular reason why that should not be included in this definition of fossil fuel infrastructure as well, in addition to the, the uh, pipelines, I think, that were originally envisioned under the bill. So we are supportive of, of those improvements. Um, we, we support 51 over this, the ban on fossil fuel uh, infrastructure over the idea of uh, pursuing uh, a ban on the use of eminent domain for fossil fuel uh, development, uh, in some ways because, as the professor noted, the direct approach, that is to say going directly at the idea that further development of new fossil fuel infrastructure is at odds with, with what Vermont has established as our own policy and goals for the state seems to um, call for a, a direct policy that says, therefore, we are not going to build fossil fuel infrastructure in the state, instead of the more indirect path of saying you simply can't use eminent domain for the construction of fossil fuel infrastructure. Bless you, Representative. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, so that, it's not clear to me um, why, unless you see a problem that I don't see, I guess, with H51, why you would move to the eminent domain uh, route. It is, after all, possible for a uh, fossil fuel infrastructure of some sort, a pipeline, let's say, to still be built, um, even if you had that restriction in place. It might take longer, um, but cost, uh, as was pointed out earlier, is really not the issue for the utilities uh, in that case. Um, and it may be that it is too much of a, of a, of a time burden and they, they give up on it, but it's, it's kind of a roundabout way of getting to the place that I think you would get to more directly by simply saying, as a matter of state policy, we do not want to build more fossil fuel infrastructure in Vermont. Uh, do you mind this Interesting now or uh, not at all. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, so I have a, a question in, in I mean there's the you know the broad framework of of a pipeline is a fifty year investment. Um, there's also the the <laughs> the lesser of two evils picture, you know, uh, Ticonderoga between burning natural gas or burning tires, I'd go with natural gas, probably. <laughs> um, but specifically I'm when you when you talk about uh, no new generation, and um, just wondering about the the McNeil plant and the district heating, which calls for I believe natural gas fired uh, standby generation. When for if the plant is if the wood burning plant is down, being cleaned, things like that. And I'm um, 
I'm just wondering how that a, a band fits in with with that. So that would be language that would be would have to be added to the bill as it stands right now. It is not contained in the bill. It deals really with pipelines primarily right now. And so I guess it could be up to this committee to decide what to do in a case like that where you're talking about a facility that is primarily uh, using wood chips and not fossil fuels and is an existing facility. Um, and if you needed that in order to do the heat portion of that project, district heat, which which I should step back. I mean, we, we would never support the construction of a McNeil today just to provide electricity. It's a terribly inefficient project. If it didn't have the, the heating aspect as well, it really doesn't make a lot of sense from our perspective. Uh, so I, I have to s s kind of stop there and say I'm not expert enough to know what the next step is or stage is with McNeil and what role gas would play in that. But it could be that you could craft it either way uh, as to kind of what makes sense there. I, I would say that I'm primarily concerned about the construction of a new gas-fired power you know, generating uh, plant in the state, and that, that's what I'm mostly focused on here when we talk about that, uh, that kind of facility. So that's the short answer. So what's your position on uh, distribution lines? Um, for instance, if uh, the transmission pipeline is already built out to Middlebury, and uh, town along the, the route, decided that they wanted to uh, uh, hook up to that uh, and have their community take advantage of it. It's the best um, room in the house. That would be a distribution line. And would, is your position that we should ban that too, or would that be allowed? Uh, it, it seems to me that this is an area where you're getting um, kind of specific. So if the pipeline goes right in front of somebody's house and you, they say, hey, I want the you know, the, the, well, the line would have to ha have some sort of a uh, uh, gate that would put down pressure in. Right. Uh, and so I, I think <clears throat> the better policy from a climate perspective is to say no to that kind of distribution line. I, I think there is a reasonableness question that comes in when you say the gas line is already running in front of somebody's house. And should they be able to hook up to that gas line? or be the last home on the street to do it, as Mr. Dumont mentioned earlier, you know, that, that's a, um, a de minimis, uh, you know, uh, additional use of gas in that case. And so I would say, you'd be reasonable, you say, yes, we're gonna allow that. At some point, you're, you're trying to decide what's, where's the right balance as a matter of public policy. From a climate perspective, I, I think the larger it is, the more likely we, I would be to say, the better policy is to say no. We're going to say no to that kind of new infrastructure for fossil fuels and encourage them to pursue other opportunities. Are you, are you going to move on to 214? Before I get there, I have one more thing to okay. say. Okay. Um, because, Representative, I think you had, you had asked about other states that were looking at um, this issue. And I don't, I don't know of other states that have put a ban on fossil fuel infrastructure in this way, but as you may know, there are other places that have done it. So Portland, Oregon, uh, for instance, has um, put a ban on certain fossil fuel infrastructure there. And uh, these cases have been litigated. Um, I'll get you the, uh, uh, the information on these cases, uh, but there, um, they were, uh, uh, the rationale used by the city was to protect uh, the health and safety of the citizens there. Um, and uh, they banned new fossil fuel infrastructure uh, in the city through new zoning ordinances. And ultimately the court, when it was challenged, ruled in favor of the city. They ruled that based on the fact that there was uh, non-discriminatory local laws to regulate even-handedly um, uh, and to effectuate a local, a legitimate local interest. They had only incidental effects on interstate commerce, and therefore it was valid. Um, and uh, so they essentially said that the that the local benefits put forward by the city of Portland, Oregon, outweighed the more incidental effects uh, on commerce in that case. There is another case out of South Portland, Maine, from 2014, uh, that banned uh, the loading of bulk crude oil <coughs> into tankers on the city's waterfront there. Uh, that ordinance was voted on by residents of the city, then passed by the city council, who had concerns about air quality, water quality, aesthetics, odors, climate change, the value uh, on property, uh, and all associated with this proposed development there. And ultimately, again, the court concluded that um, 
this. If there were crude oil producers in Maine or in the city of South Portland specifically, the city's legislation would be equally, equally applicable to those um, because there would be no differential treatment of the stakeholders within the state, the ordinance was deemed constitutional. There's more to those cases than what I've shared with you, of course, but the idea is you had, you had local actors in these cases saying no to a particular kind of fossil fuel infrastructure there where the opponents, and we might expect the same in this case, charged that this was a violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause and potentially other areas of law as well, and uh, that went through the courts there and they were upheld as constitutional. So it is possible to, to put these kind of bans on fossil fuel infrastructure in, in place where they will be upheld. Um, and on the uh, last, on the eminent domain, we don't. I, I wouldn't. I don't want to. I want to be clear that I'm not opposing that legislation. We would support that if the committee, in its wisdom, decided that it was not inclined to pursue um, H51, the ban on fossil fuel infrastructure more broadly. We would happily participate in you know any conversations on that, and would likely be supportive. But we do also recognize the need to preserve. Um, the use of eminent domain uh, for projects that are not fossil fuel projects because you will need them as you know for for various other things um, including uh, renewable energy and so um, so to some extent I, I understand the professor's concerns um, on that score um, on 214 I have not uh, I haven't spent as much time uh, with that I I recognize the value we have uh, uh, in the past been concerned about stranded costs of other projects uh, in the state, have weighed in on, on some of those. Um, I understand they wouldn't necessarily change, as it's written now, wouldn't necessarily change the process by which projects are considered because this has been the practice of the PUC. Um, if, however, the, the legislation were amended to move more along the lines of what you, Mr. Chairman, were talking about, uh, that is putting some sort of, as a matter of state policy, some limits on the useful life of infrastructure projects, uh, that, it seems to me, could have a pretty significant impact on what happens when, as projects are being considered in front of the PUC. Um, and, it's a, and, it's, and it's not uh, merely, um, you're not making this up. I mean, that, that is the plan of the state, after all, to move away from fossil fuel projects. It, it does concern me when we hear about, for instance, pipeline projects described sometimes as, uh, as a bridge, or the, 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 the natural gas in this case is a bridge fuel. It's not at all a bridge fuel when you're talking about putting it into a pipeline underground that could, could easily last 50, 60, 70, 80 years. I mean, that's not a bridge to anything. Um, and, and I think it is inappropriate to be talking about it in those kind of terms. But if instead we were to say, it's, we're not going to, as a matter of policy, allow this to be considered as an 80-year project or a 50-year project, even when the policy of the state is to be getting our our energy um, from renewable resources beyond a certain after a certain point. Uh, that changes the calculus, and I think that's appropriate. Uh, so I'm I hadn't given a lot of thought before this uh, this meeting here today. So I may have anticipated your question, Representative, but that's that's kind of where we are, I think, on that. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> Uh, and that, uh, that's our testimony. I, I really appreciate the fact that you're digging into these issues. I, I do think it's important to kind of look at both sides of the coin to consider how do we move forward with the positive vision of clean energy and the keeping money in the state, keeping jobs uh, in, in this state um, in the way that we, that we kind of would like to. And at the same time, recognizing we're doing that for a good reason, and it is to avoid some of the negative effects of uh, building out of these fossil fuels. Paul, you talked earlier about 100% clean renewable energy. I didn't hear a date. Um, and I guess, has uh, VPIRG done any analysis as to what that would look like uh, regarding you know, ridge lines, what it feels, whatever it is for the, the number of solar, the number, of, and, and, and would it be all in-state that you're looking for 100% renewables? Uh, a lot of questions there. I just wonder if any analysis. I'd love to come back, Representative, and talk more specifically about it because I don't have that for you here today. You are probably seeing a number of states that have moved forward and even are not only considering, but a number have now adopted plans to move to 100% at least clean electricity. I think New Mexico was the most recent just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, and these states are they're not all states that you would consider to be um, kind of leading edge or more progressive in their policies. I mean, you know, 
one of the biggest, I don't think Texas has adopted this, but you know, one of the biggest in terms of renewable energy development is, is the state of Texas uh, right now. So you're seeing a lot of movement in that in that direction. I'd be happy to uh, to get back to you as we look, you know, more into what that would mean for this state. Um, but you're certainly looking out over time, and our our time horizon is growing shorter too as we consider what we can possibly do to to hold off the worst effects of climate change. And um, you know the numbers, I'm sure, as well as I do. But you know, a little over a decade to try to really get a handle on this and to move aggressively. We have to move very rapidly toward adoption of clean, renewable energy. And even, I might say more than that, to reduce our energy usage overall. We, we need to be cutting our demands for electricity uh, to the greatest degree that we can if we are ever going to hope to get there. Because you can't just say we're going to use as much as we are or ever more uh, and just get it from renewable resources because that, that too is not going to be enough. But we're not, we wouldn't have the capacity. And we wouldn't have the capacity to do it all in state either. Um, so I think you'll probably see some sort of mix there, but I don't think it's, it's always been our position that if we have the capacity to generate clean renewable energy in this state, that we should do so to, to the degree that we can reasonably um, and shouldn't just rely on somebody else to produce the power for us because we can generate solar and we can generate wind energy and we can generate hydro energy in this state. And if we have the resources, why should we ask somebody else to incur those costs uh, for us? but I'm going to follow Mark's lead and respond, not respond, but at query your testimony. The, one of the things I'm really concerned about is whether or not we are acting with as much urgency on infrastructure and the actual right now threats that we are seeing from climate change to Vermonters. I'm worried about if we're correctly balanced in our sense of urgency um, on those two things. Do you have any thoughts on that in terms of uh, your organization's priorities, what you're hearing from Vermonters? Do you understand my question? Well, uh, uh, I can respond to the priorities, but tell me uh, if you would mind more what you mean when you talk about infrastructure. So, roads, power, um, you know, uh, public safety uh, institutions, uh, the things that are impacted by, you know, significant storms, which we are seeing with more and more frequency. And so, because if we remove in Vermont, or if we eliminate all emissions in Vermont, we will not stop that impact that we are feeling right now from happening to Vermonters. And so, I'm concerned, and yet we need to do that. So, what are the, are we, are we balanced appropriately? And I want to understand if we are. Yeah, I, I'm not the expert on that, though. I think... Um, it's fair to say that most people would say that neither Vermont nor probably any other state is, is thinking um, uh, with an, enough, is not, it's not doing enough to act and prepare for the effects that we are likely to feel uh, and to some extent that we are we already are feeling, feeling from climate change. Um, and uh, that means our budgets will have to grow significantly just to deal with the effects of um, what does the cl changing climate mean for us? Uh, it will mean you know more severe weather um, events in the state, and that means that roads and culverts and so forth will be washed out. And I know that there was some good thinking done here in the uh, aftermath of Irene um, and thinking about you know. Are we doing culverts the right way? And had to petition the feds to, to make sure that they were a certain size and so forth. And they say, I'm not the expert on that side of things. For the most part, we, as an organization, spend more of our time and resources trying to fight for policies that will help to um, address the problem of climate change as opposed to the effects of climate change here. But, and, uh, and, I, and I understand that, and I hear that, and I believe that that's that we all have to have a shared sense of urgency around that. But when I think about um, what we are facing right now, I and mean, we've had utilities in this year and asked them if they're seeing an increase in storms. We, I mean, I've, I've been, to, it's not just, you know, Irene. And so it is an open question for me. So just about how, how we balance protecting Vermonters right now and in the future. And the right now are the effects the effects are not in the future. They're happening right now. No question. And, and the only thing I would add, I guess, is that it is likely to get 
even worse. worse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's the trajectory that we are on. We are feeling it now, really, with, beyond a scientific doubt, I think, at this point. But it's going to get worse. All our breath, all our energy, all our angst in this building, and don't address infrastructure as well. That concerns me. So I'm trying to learn and understand if we are doing the answer, likely answer is no, but you can find a better expert than me to, to describe those details. Thank you for the question. I wish we could be more helpful. And I guess even to, to follow up on that, you had said that budgets will have to grow. So again, when we're looking at $733 million in Vermont's you know, destruction from Irene alone, um, I granted a lot of that's federal money and so on, but um, so how do we, how do we mitigate the effects that are happening right now, as well as grow the budget for climate change. That's why you get the big bucks, Representative. <laughs> well, said, that's <laughs> you know that's that's the big question. You're right, but I mean to go down this road to just say, oh, we're going to have you know 100% renewables by, of course, there's no date there. Um, I need to see that. I need to see that. I mean, I, I have to have some way to tell my constituents that, okay, we're going to go down this road. This is how we're going to achieve it, and this is what it's going to cost you. Or this is what the ridge lines are going to look like. Or this is, you know, it's not that simple. You make it sound so simple, and it's not that simple. You say that we've got the capacity to put in wind towers and solar panels and all that. You know, I don't know if you know what happened up my way when, when the low wind project went in, but it was, it was devastating to communities. And um, it's the last one that's gone in. Um, so. Uh, you know, you're gonna, you are, believe it or not, going to have some pushback on the other end from some other groups as far as uh, renewable energy and what it does to the environment and water quality and wildlife and you know th there is a, there is a price to pay as well. So um, that's that's my concern. Again, the the toll mitigating for what we have now, as well as budget increases for renewable or whatever it is in the future. Uh, I, I understand the point. I think from my perspective, and the, when we think about climate change, we look at it as an existential threat to our survival and the costs that will come because of our failure to deal effectively, not just our failure in Vermont, but our failure as humanity you know, to deal with uh, the amount of greenhouse gas, uh, uh, greenhouse gases that we put into the atmosphere, and and the climate change that results from that, uh, is catastrophic. Um, it's hard to compare that with uh, the concerns, whether they be aesthetic or clean water or habitat, with putting in renewable energy projects here. I do think that you're going to have to, we collectively are going to have to make some decisions like that. Are we willing to say we will, we will do more for energy efficiency, we will put more money into that? You all just went through a, a debate over that, which was in the end, a, I would say, a rather modest proposal, but an important one to move forward when you talk about weatherizing homes in this state. But that's a, that is not on the scale of what Vermont needs to be doing in our opinion, to, in order to say we've done our part um, to deal with climate change. And after all, Vermont, Vermont's just not just another state. We are looked to as leaders when it comes to protecting public health, when it comes to protecting climate and, and the environment. And so I do think that um, we all, and certainly you as elected officials, have a responsibility to lead in that way. So I, I want to do whatever I can to encourage you that way and try to be as helpful as we can. But it's not without tough decisions, Representative. I understand that and, and uh, appreciate that. Right um, this isn't a question for you, Paul. It's responding to points of, of discussion. Um, one is a perspective and, and one is an um, observation, I guess, and, and one being that I think where we all benefit is where we find the overlap between building that resiliency um, and doing and doing climate work. And I mean, a very small example of that would be uh, no-till agriculture and cover cropping. Um, so wherever we can find those, I hate to use the word synergy, but I can't think of another one right now. <laughs> those mutual benefits. I think there, there's a lot of opportunity there to to those 
And the other is, um, you know, you, you mentioned the, the, the costs of wind, the impacts on local residents. And I would argue that we've been outsourcing those costs all along um, to places where fracking is going on for oil to, um, you know, the, the James Bay massive hydro projects to wherever. Whatever the, the source of generation is, there are negative external costs. And we have been very fortunate in being able to outsource those all my life. Um, and so I guess from my perspective, there's a little bit of accepting responsibility in recognizing and accepting the negative external impacts of our energy use. That's my little soapbox. Yeah, so Paul, uh, you referenced a number of cases in your testimony, and um, I hope you'll be able to provide what you've got there to the committee so that we can, I like to keep online copies. <laughs> Certainly will. Yeah, I like to keep it on my hard drive instead of uh, in my folders here. Um, and, you know, the, the whole aspect of uh, the cost of doing this, it is going to cost money. But I think it's a question of pay me, pay now or pay later. And as we, you know, as climate change has more and more impacts down the road, we're going to find ourselves paying a lot more later if we don't address it now. And just addressing it here in Vermont is not necessarily going to alleviate those costs in the future because there's, you know, continued generation of greenhouse gases not only throughout the country but throughout the world. And, uh, but we, we've got to do our part, in my opinion, and act as leaders uh, uh, so that others can see the example we give and, and join us. My pulpit, look at that. That's my soapbox. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, 120 seconds. And then we're going to <laughs> We've got two more witnesses today, um, and I expect that uh, collectively they will probably take less than an hour. Um, the, the two witnesses, which we're going to pull in by phone, are um, uh, from NCSL and um, the Council of State Governments. Um, both uh, Christy Hartman and, and Rona Cohen have done some essentially research on our behalf, looking at what some other states have done uh, in this area. Um, the memos that they've submitted to us are on our website, so you can pull those up if you'd like. Um, but generally asking them to speak to some of the research that they've done on, on, on what other state legislators or local governments have done. So. Um, and when I stepped out just uh, a few minutes ago, just to say no, um, there were some, uh, but actually I don't know if they were with a specific organization, um, but some youth climate activists. I don't know if they were with um, 350 Vermont. Or, yeah, do you know if they were, or were they? I don't know what organization they were with, but I saw folks from 350 down there with them. Okay, so they may have been. Um, but they had presented to me um, uh, some things that they had written uh, expressing their um, focus and their uh, desire for our committee and the legislature generally to, to do work on um, uh, climate change legislation, and they had tied each of those um, messages to pussy willows, which I have put in a cup of water <laughs> outside here. I didn't bring them in, but I just wanted to let you know why I stepped out for a few minutes. So, um, don't pick the pussy willows up, so no, no, well, they handed them to me. They, so, um, so I'm going to dial in uh, Christy Hartman right now, who's from uh, NCSL.
Hey, Christy, this is Tim Briglund calling from the Vermont House Committee on Energy and Technology. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Um, you are, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure where you are, but in our presence, you're um, uh, coming out of a cell phone, or a, um, a, uh, uh, a speaker phone uh, in the middle of our committee table. We are a committee of nine members of the Energy and Technology Committee. Um, also in our room, we have maybe a half dozen to ten other folks who are here listening to our testimony today. And um, again, thank you for joining us. I, I, I think that the call had gone out to you uh, in the last week or so, um, seeking to use NCSL as a resource, trying to essentially understand better what other states and even localities, uh, municipalities, um, are doing with regard to fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, and uh, you had prepared a memo for us, which we have on our website, so um, you know members can pull that up. But just you know, wanted to give you a chance and and and, uh, and thank you again for being able to present some of that information to us. Um, uh, so I will leave that open to you. We have um, we don't have a, a pre-prescribed time as to how much uh, time we have with you this afternoon. I was thinking, you know, up to a half an hour if that works for you. Um, and uh, I can play traffic cop on this end as, as members have questions and, um, and uh, bring them into the conversation as well. So um, we record all of our hearings for the record. So if you want to introduce yourself and then um, you know, take it away to the extent that you want to take us through some of the findings that you've got. Perfect. Well, you know, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, nice to be able to participate today and you know I certainly wish I could be there in person uh, our offices are located out in Colorado though so uh, it's sometimes difficult to get to the East Coast if it's uh, you know kind of short notice so uh, I appreciate uh, everyone kind of sitting around the phone and uh, look forward to the discussion today my name is Christy Hartman I am the energy program director for the National Conference of State Legislatures um, so we cover any kind of energy topic that is of interest to legislators and staff. Um, you know, I was pleased to kind of get this request and sort of look into uh, what type of state action is occurring related to uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. I think kind of generally um, we're seeing a huge push towards kind of clean energy and reducing emissions and we're seeing it from kind of the states that you would expect to see uh, those types of bills and measures considered, but also I would say a broader range of states is becoming you know, much more popular to look at uh, way, policies related to clean energy, but that's being, you know, playing out in many different ways. Uh, a couple years ago, we, you know, we've had requests over time from state legislatures looking for information related to fossil fuel infrastructure and uh, moratoriums or, or banning kind of specific projects uh, that is certainly growing and we're seeing efforts across more states now uh, this legislative session than we've seen in previous years however I'd also kind of mentioned that you know we see equal amounts of uh, bills related to kind of promoting fossil fuel development so we certainly see both sides uh, but there has been a number of different approaches that we're seeing state legislatures specifically take uh, looking at sort of the continued uh, use of fossil fuels and those specific limits on fossil fuel infrastructure. So this may include a full moratorium on new fossil fuel infrastructure or it may be very specific to the types of infrastructure, or to certain pipelines or export facilities, that type of thing. So what I wanted to do is just kind of take a few minutes I know that you do have uh, the document that I sent over that highlighted some city examples, but I'll take a few minutes and kind of run through um, a few different categories that we're seeing and certainly happy to answer any questions along the way, you know, just chime in or, uh, you know, ask for questions at the end. Um, and we can kind of go from there and hopefully I can provide some useful information that you can apply in Vermont. So um, with that, kind of starting most broadly looking at states that have considered the full ban so uh, I don't know that most of the bills and, and measures that I am going to describe are all pending I will say we haven't seen a lot uh, actually be enacted to date although we're seeing lots of different efforts so 
Um, starting with the full ban, full ban, New York uh, has had bills over the last couple legislative sessions that really look to uh, provide a moratorium on all new fossil fuel development. Um, the bills have always been really short and succinct. They basically include a definition of fossil fuels, so that's typically kind of the coal, petroleum products, um, any type of fuel gases. And then uh, basically the bills have, have focused on um, banning any type of permitting for new um, projects. And they do kind of spell out the type of projects that are considered. Um, similarly, in Virginia, the state has considered a couple bills, but they took a different route. The bills more focused on how to promote clean energy in the state. And then, you know, kind of as part of that, there's been just a line or two in a bill that would say banning or a moratorium on new uh, fossil fuel projects. In the case of Virginia, the bill kind of defined major uh, fossil fuel projects. And so, um, I, I'm not quite sure, and I don't know, those bills haven't really gone anywhere yet. Um, so it would be interesting to see if they actually had further discussion <clears throat> kind of what is considered major uh, projects. But uh, also those bills really focus on training the workforce, you know, related to the fossil industry um, on kind of new projects and a new skill set. So those are just a couple examples of the big kind of broad full bans that we're seeing in state legislation. I think what may be kind of more uh, active right now is kind of indi individual municipalities and counties taking action. So um, in the document that I provided, Portland, Oregon, and also uh, King County, Washington, both have uh, passed ordinances and kind of considered measures that look at um, banding banning fossil fuel infrastructure and I think you know that's what we might see more of state legislatures may have a more difficult time you know depending on the state uh, passing these kind of statewide measures but certainly uh, we're seeing more consideration from municipalities um, regarding a full moratorium or something that says hey at least for the next six months or some type of temporary time frame set to you know more explore um, you know what that would mean for the state or county there's also I think a trend that we've seen for the last several years related to specific to new pipelines and moratoriums on new pipelines I mean certainly the Northeast has seen uh, its fair share of, of pipelines proposed natural gas pipelines proposed and whether or not um, those have actually been constructed. I think there's been more cases where there's been enough pushback uh, from local citizens where those pipelines, the state legislature has kind of, or the PUC has taken action to uh, prohibit some of the construction of the new pipelines. Uh, we saw this play out in Georgia and South Carolina in the 2016-2017 legislative sessions where there was a pipeline that was, a, a big pipeline that was considered that would uh, bring primarily diesel between South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And both South Carolina and Georgia uh, passed bills in the 2016 legislative session putting temporary moratoriums on any new construction of pipelines. And uh, I would have to go back and look, but I think that the bills were kind of broadly to any type of uh, pipeline carrying hazardous materials. Um, in the 2017 legislative session, Georgia in particular uh, really looked more into kind of where they wanted to go and whether or not to approve this pipeline. They basically passed a bill that uh, focused more on eminent domain uh, and eventually said, okay, this pipeline can occur, but the exact route that was proposed by the company would not work. Um, and they put more restrictions on uh, the approval process for the siting of the pipeline. Um, and then uh, they really focused on kind of setting limitations and requiring more information from the pipeline companies. So they, Georgia and South Carolina both decided uh, that, you know, the state legislature at least would provide an avenue for approval of new pipeline projects, which made it 
much more stringent than either state had prior to that experience. Uh, New York State doesn't have a moratorium on new pipelines in place, but um, they have basically their state environmental agency has denied uh, any permit request, citing environmental reasons as as kind of the main uh, source. So even though they don't have something in statute, they are kind of in effect operating in that way. And then Pennsylvania is the last. Um, state that I saw this legislative session that has a bill pending that would place a moratorium on permitting new hazardous liquid pipelines. So they were kind of specific in the type of pipeline. Granted, you know, Pennsylvania being a, a major natural gas state, I think still want to find ways to uh, get export natural gas from their state to other states. Hey, can I interrupt you just quickly, Christy? This is Tim Briglin again. Um, to, sure. to, to what extent uh, are these various states constrained by um, the pipelines that they're looking to prohibit or somehow influence the expansion of? Are they constrained by FERC and these actually being, um, you know, inter interstate pipeline issues as opposed to um, you know, something that can be contained within uh, the state jurisdiction? Certainly, that's a huge issue um, that has come up a lot and. Uh, you know, they, you know, for the state kind of legislative role, there isn't a lot of action you can take when it falls under FERC's jurisdiction. And so um, I say that comes up in a lot of these instances, and they are definitely um, kind of constrained in what they can do. In the cases where uh, it's primarily federal oversight, you know, I haven't seen a lot of specific state action that's kind of counteracted whatever the federal proposal or approval was. Okay. So I, I'm not looking at you to pass judgment on any of these bills, but um, <coughs> I guess I have to assume that they are, these things that you're talking about, that the states and the legislation proposed are, are feasible. Uh, you know, they're, it's something that can be done. They're not constrained by FERC. Well, I would say, I mean, you know, some of the, and I'm not in each of these states, but I am kind of monitoring the overall trends. Certainly, you know, a legislator could introduce a bill on, you know, kind of any policy that they so chose. And at some point, it, you know, even if it was enacted, it could go to a court case to kind of be determined who has jurisdiction. Um, so I wouldn't say that all of these bills necessarily, you know, for sure right now have uh, no kind of for jurisdictional issues because I feel like that kind of comes up as the bills get closer to being enacted and certainly doesn't prevent uh, some legislators from at least proposing these topics. Um, and you know, and maybe some of these bills are just to get the discussions going. Maybe the purpose is not actually to get the bill enacted. Okay. Uh, but for the most part, I think these are, you know, I'm trying to highlight bills that I think um, have serious consideration. So, yeah. kind of moving on to another bucket right. that. Uh, Christy, can we uh, interrupt you one more uh, time? Uh, Representative sure. Yantachka has a question. Yeah, uh, so Christy, um, are any of the bills that have been passed and enacted into law been challenged in court to your knowledge? I don't, not any of the bills that I've raised so far. I'm trying to think. I mean, definitely related to pipelines. I'd have to do a little bit more uh, research to get specific examples, but I know some of these pipeline uh, issues have gone to the courts. You know, I think it's, you know, states are kind of grappling with, we have abundant natural gas at lower prices right now, and it's really appealing to, um, you know, take advantage of that resource. And we certainly have a strong natural gas industry, oil and natural gas industry, that is pushing those efforts. Um, and so for states trying to balance kind of where they want state headed in the future and um, kind of what resource mix, I know that that has kind of come to a head a little bit. But uh, if you're interested in kind of specific examples, I'd be happy to do a little bit of research and send you anything I can find. Okay, thank you. So one of the other kind of big areas that we're seeing relates to hydraulic fracturing, and 
you know, I think from 2011 to about 2015, you know, we saw tons of state action related to different aspects of hydraulic fracturing uh, and making sure that states felt like they had proper regulations in place. I mean, oftentimes when we see this through multiple technologies, the technology moves faster than the policies. And so um, in some cases, states were trying to play catch up and make sure that they had sound regulations in place related to the hydraulic fracturing process. And, you know, since 2015, it's been a little bit quieter in, you know, the number of bills and the types of bills that we're seeing across the country related specifically to hydraulic fracturing. What's kind of interesting, this legislative session is now we're seeing that boost again of uh, limiting certain uh, aspects of hydraulic fracturing or the drilling process uh, or just outright bans on hydraulic fracturing. And I think that plays into uh, the state efforts looking kind of into the future and longer kind of clean energy goals for the state and uh, not seeing as much of a role for oil and gas in that. So uh, just of interest, nine states so far have proposed bills that would limit aspects of hydraulic fracturing, which is certainly an increase over the last several years. And then uh, one other kind of item to point out, we're seeing lots of other um, kind of prohibitions related to fossil fuel development. Uh, California has a measure that would limit fossil fuel production on public lands in particular. Connecticut has a couple bills that are under consideration that really focus on protecting the consumer and they prohibit any type of surcharge on a customer's bill if it relates to the expansion of pipeline activity. And I think uh, those types of measures we may see more of, um, kind of the consumer protection role. So uh, there's, there's a bunch of other types of bills that we're seeing that kind of limit certain aspects but not fully uh, prevent the future of fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, I think kind of the big thing right now is that we're seeing a lot of different proposals, but like I mentioned before, we haven't seen a lot of these bills passed yet. Uh, in previous sessions, you know, we may only see a couple states look at fossil fuel infrastructure and whether to put any limitations on that. This session, we're definitely seeing more states, but we're still not seeing those bills uh, pass the state legislatures. So I think kind of with that, that's just a real brief overview, um, but happy to answer kind of any other questions or certainly if I don't know the answer, do some research and get back to you. I have a question. This is Representative Chestnut Tangerman, although other people at, around the table may know the answer to this, which is uh, a couple of years ago when our uh, Vermont Yankee the nuclear power plant closed and there was a proposal to put a uh, natural gas burning generating station at the on that site and but that was dependent on a pipeline passing through Massachusetts um, which was I, I don't know what uh, if it was defeated by referendum or a, um, a spur yeah a spur off of an existing pipeline do you know anything about the whether that was uh, moratorium of a bill of permitting process of referendum i i do remember uh reading about it i don't remember exactly what happened i know massachusetts has had uh, a ton of bills you know at least kind of 10 per session that look specifically at pipelines and kind of preventing uh, inciting of of the pipelines um certainly the legislature has not shown much support for uh, expanding kind of the pipeline network. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not sure specifically what happened uh, with that. If, if no one else in the room knows, I'd be happy just to run a quick search. So I think that would be pretty easy to find. Thank you. Kinder Morgan. It was Kinder Morgan pipeline for. Uh-huh. Okay. Mark. Uh, Christy, just you had mentioned nine states with a fracking ban. Is Vermont on that list? Uh, so it's not any state that has a uh, ban in place. That was just states that considered legislation this session. So I don't think Vermont is on that. I think Vermont does have a ban Because we do have a fracking <laughs> ban. You have a ban already in place. Correct. Yes. yes. Yeah. And it so you say the nine, there's nine states that have considered a ban. 
this session, but then there's another five or so states that already have a ban in place. So, you know, it's kind of, it's pretty substantial. Granted, there's a couple states that don't have any oil and gas development, so it's, you know, more just kind of a, a signal of, of the support that they're providing. But I think in most cases, you know, the oil and gas industry is pretty active in the state, so it's, it is sort of a big measure. So again, that was nine that are considering it and five that have it? Currently? I think so. I can okay. double check well, that's fine. If, I, if I remember correctly, but it is around a handful of states have bans already in place. Well, oh, thank you. And Vermont's one of those that doesn't really have any oil and gas production anyway. There we go. <laughs> Resources. Um, any other questions for Christy? Christy, thank you very much for the, for the research that you've done for us. And, um, you know, I, I know a few other questions have come up here on the call, uh, and we'll, we'll you know, welcome any feedback that you have in response to those as well. So, um, so thank you for your time today. Perfect. Well, thank you all. I appreciate it. And if anything else comes up, you know, do you know, Sarah has my contact information, but please feel free to reach out to me, and I'd be happy to kind of look into it and, and share anything that other states are doing. Great. Thanks so much. Take thank care. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Really to call Rona, Sarah? What do you think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's Tim Brigland again. Hi, how are you? I'm well. Thank you for uh, for being ready even in, in advance. Um, uh, just to kind of let you know the, the setting here, you're um, on the speakerphone. We've got nine members of our committee, uh, the House Energy and Technology Committee in the Vermont Legislature. Um, we've got another handful of people in the room who are um, you know interested uh, uh, listeners in on the testimony. And um, our committee in recent days and work, uh, weeks have, have done a little bit of work and a little bit of exploration into kind of what's going on in the fossil fuel infrastructure ban world. We have three bills that are, uh, have been introduced in our, in our committee. Um, <coughs> and we have uh, essentially reached out to you um, as, a, as a research resource for us to better understand what you know may be going on in other parts of the country in this realm, and um, so appreciate you joining us today to, to share with us some of the some of the work that you've done. Um, we we record each of our hearings, so if you can uh, introduce yourself for the record, and um, if it's okay with you, um, we'll just let you kind of go through some of the information uh, you found. We have your. Um, your memorandum on our website, so members have that in front of them, and uh, take it away. Okay, sure, great, well thank you. Um, so yeah, so my name is Rona Cohen, and I am the Senior Policy Analyst in the Energy and Environment Program here in the Eastern Office of the Council of State Government. And uh, thank you so much, Chair Bridgman and, and members of the committee for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, so, so this is an issue that we have not really officially taken up at the Council of State Government. So I was actually really delighted to have the opportunity to do some research. So I've researched efforts at the state, local, and county levels to place moratoria on fossil fuel infrastructure. And I found legislative proposals in a couple of states um, that were not successful uh, in New York State last session and this year in Virginia and some successful efforts in King County, Washington, plus a few cities, um, mainly on the West Coast, that have established permanent or temporary moratoria, pr primarily on bulk storage facilities. Um, and so I can take you briefly through these efforts and, and by all means interrupt if you have any questions. So the bans that have been enacted at the local or municipal level as I said, they largely affect storage facilities, new and expanded crude oil terminals, refineries, uh, storage of natural gas and, and coal. So I'll start with, with Portland. So the city of Portland in 2016 became 
the first city to establish a moratorium on fossil fuel infrastructure through their fossil fuel zoning amendment. Portland's ban covers new and significantly expanded fossil fuel terminals. And note that there was a legal challenge from petroleum trade groups and a few local business coalitions and from what looks to be workers' trade organizations. The groups argued that the city had overstepped its constitutional bounds by effectively blocking interstate commerce. And this was an argument that the State Land Use Court, which is referred to by the acronym ZUBA, um, upheld in July 2017. And so the city then appealed to the Oregon Court of Appeals and, and won, and the decision ultimately was upheld by the State Supreme Court in July. And uh, I could take you through a little bit um, what the explanation was given by the court, if, if that would be helpful to you. Yeah, in a high level, I think that would be. Yeah, okay. So, so essentially, to prove that the amendments were, were blocking interstate commerce, the groups would have to show that they were benefiting in-state entities at the expense of out-of-state ones. But apparently, neither the city of Portland or the state of Oregon have in-state economic entities that are involved in refining or distribution of fossil fuels. Um, so because of that, there could be no discrimination between substantially similar out-of-state and in-state economic entities. Um, so in other words, in-state economic entities were not benefiting at the expense of, at the expense of out-of-state ones in this case. Um, so also, the amendments don't prohibit fuel exports through Portland. Essentially, they just restrict the size of certain terminals. So, so those exports can continue, but there, there is no ban on them. And also, the court found that the amendments demonstrated legitimate local benefits to residents through, for example, reduced health emissions, um, from limiting the potential exposure to accidents or explosions, and from reducing the number and size of terminals in an earthquake liquefaction zone. Uh, apparently, a lot of these terminals are located near a very large fault line that runs through the state of Oregon. <laughs> It's probably something you don't have to deal with in Vermont. Not that we know, every, every 500 years or so, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, I have a, I have okay. a question on yeah, that part of it. Um, you had said that uh, it went to the Supreme Court and the decision was just in July. Was, was that July of 2008? I, I, right, so, I, so what happened was the, the Oregon Court of Appeals, um, so, uh, they uh, approved, they moved in favor of the city, and I believe that was in July of 2018. I have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure it was. And then the state Supreme Court apparently decided not to take up the case. Okay, so in that length of time, so you said from 2016 to 2018, uh, were they still allowed to uh, expand that infrastructure, or no? Um, you know, that's a good question. I, I'll have to check on that and find out for you. Okay. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so, so Baltimore is the other city um, that enacted a, a similar moratorium to Portland. Um, so the city enacted it in its, um, last year that amended the city's zoning code to prohibit new or expanded crude oil terminals. And I've been searching, but I have not been able to find any legal challenges to that ordinance. <laughs> now, at the county level, Kings County, Washington, which includes the city of Seattle, in January, this past January, passed a six-month moratorium on building or expanding major new fossil fuel infrastructure making it the first county in the nation to take such action. So the ordinance doesn't directly address pipelines or rail infrastructure from what I've been able to read. It refers to the terminals, to bulk storage, and facilities engaged in wholesale distribution, extraction, and refinement or processing of fossil fuels that's taken directly from the ordinance. 
Um, and so during the moratorium, officials are directed to study existing fossil fuel infrastructure. I believe that they were required um, within 60 days of passage of the ordinance to have a public hearing. Um, and the idea is to, to study the, the existing infrastructure and determine if they would like to enact a permanent moratorium. So I imagine that uh, I imagine that they will be having the hearing soon if they have already. I've got a question on that, I guess, as well. So uh, that list of facilities in King County, Washington, do they, do they have any of those type of facilities, or are they all outside of the county? I mean... No, I believe, I believe they do have within the county. Okay, so they, that would include extraction, uh, drilling, extraction, the list, the list would be pretty broad. The list, yeah, the list is really broad. Okay. Um, you know, yeah, when I think about extraction, I kind of doubt, I doubt that they do. I don't, I don't work with Washington State, so I'm not entirely sure. Um, so I can check on that, but I believe they have refineries. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Um, okay, so in terms of the state effort, there are two that I came across, and their bans would have been far more comprehensive than the local or county ones that I just mentioned. So the first one is legislation that was introduced last session in New York State that would have banned all fossil fuel infrastructure, including the distribution, processing, storage, or extraction of fossil fuels. It also notably would ban nuclear power by 2030. Um, and this is a really broad bill. It calls for 100% renewable energy by 2030, zero carbon emissions from energy by 2030. It calls on the state to create a climate action plan to phase out landfills, um, lead to, to zero, uh, zero waste disposal systems. Vehicles would have to be all electric or otherwise zero carbon by 2025. And all buildings would be zero emission by 2020. There are a number of other measures. These are just sort of the, the highlights that I'm trying in here. Um, now, from what I've been able to find, well, first of all, I, I call the offices of the various sponsors in the Assembly and in the Senate. I was told that the legislation did not move. Um, it was not reintroduced this session. Um, so I, I wasn't able to find if there was really any activity on this legislation, unfortunately. Um, but what I did find is that it was modeled after a federal bill called the Federal Off Fossil Fuel Bill um, that was uh, introduced by uh, lead sponsor Representative Gabbard from Hawaii. Um, and that called for 100% clean energy by 2035, 100% zero emission vehicles by 2035, and an immediate moratorium on all fossil fuel infrastructure, among other provisions. Now, in Virginia, there was a piece of legislation that was considered um, this year um, that did not make it through the House that by 2020 would have placed a ban on all new fossil fuel generation, export and import terminals, gathering lines and pipelines, refineries, and extraction. Would have called for 100% clean energy by 2036 and would have called for the creation of a climate action plan, among other things. Um, from what I was able to, to learn, the, the moratorium was, was the most controversial element of that bill, and there was a move to amend it, remove the moratorium. Uh, my understanding is that there actually would have been support for the other provisions, including 100% clean energy by 2036, um, but, in, but that uh, amendment was not created and it, it did not move forward. Now, I, I searched, I did various searches to see if there were any other, with any other legislation, similar legislation introduced in any other state, and I really wasn't able to find anything. Um, that doesn't mean that it that nothing was introduced, but uh, just that I wasn't able to find any any similar bills. Um, so in my memo, I did include a summary of a research report that was prepared in 2015 by the analysis group, which is an economic consulting firm. Um, they prepared this analysis for the Massachusetts Attorney, Attorney General's Office to assess the need for additional natural gas 
pipeline capacity through 2030 to maintain power system reliability and control repair costs. And I thought that this report might, might be helpful to you. And in fact, I did reach out to one of the report's um, authors, Paul Hibbert, who has participated in meetings of ours in the past, um, who apparently was not available to speak to you today, but said it would be available later in the week should you have questions about the methodology, methodology right. that you use. Um, but just briefly, in terms of the findings, the study concluded that given the region's current electricity market structure, power system reliability will be maintained with or without electric repair investment in new natural gas pipeline capacity between now and 2030. So I thought, I thought those findings might be, might be interesting to you as you consider these three bills that you have before you. Thank you, and, and we're, we're actually speaking with Mr. Hibbert on uh, Thursday this week. Oh, okay, so then I'll let you talk to him uh, about how, how he, um, the, the methodology that he used. And, and um, my main question was, have his findings changed? Have they done an updated analysis based on the current electricity system makeup, you know, which is obviously constantly changing as more renewables are incorporated into the system? Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll let you talk to him then about those findings. I, I hope that they'll, they'll be helpful to you in your efforts. I've um, got a question for you, Rona. Sure. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Rona, the, on the um, Virginia one, um, somehow I got off that uh, particular document here. <laughs> um, I guess I lost it. Uh, anyway, um, <coughs> did, um, when, when they talk about going to 100% renewable energy by 2036? Uh, yeah, 2036 uh, in Virginia. In Virginia. Um, was that just electric energy or was that overall transportation and um, heating and everything else? I believe the New York one was 100%. Um, let me check the Virginia one. Okay. I, I actually, I have it up on my screen here, um, if you can bear with me. Um, no, it's electricity. It's, it's not just all electricity, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I believe the New York one was, they, they just defined it as energy. Uh -huh. Which is kind of, uh, I think, the first that I've seen. Okay. Well, that's, that's what I was wondering. Uh, 2036 seemed like a pretty short runway, but for yeah. electricity, it's possible. Mm -hmm. It's short. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Rona? Rona, thank you. Your memo is very helpful just in terms of, you know, particularly with the links, frankly, that we can uh, pull up some of the other information. Um, uh, so we really appreciate the time you put into this. I think there were a couple of follow-up questions, which we um, also appreciate your feedback on. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I will keep searching. If I can find more related information, I will certainly send it to you. Thank you. Thanks much. Okay, well, thank you. All right, take care. Okay, you too. Bye. Bye. Great. That's it. So we're, we're going to have follow-up on some of the things that she had mentioned on Thursday. <clears throat> Great. That concludes our work for today.